Right, hello and welcome back to another video. This week we're going to be carrying on with our mesh particle swarm uh, from the content examples um, and we're going to be hopefully getting to uh, a finished piece. Um, there is going to be a little bug in this. Uh, unfortunately there's an issue with 427 uh, so I'm not going to be able to recreate everything that they do exactly, but we'll talk about what they're doing and we'll, and we'll sort of talk about how and why and then hopefully we can use that in our, um, in our future effects. Uh, I've been told it should be uh, fixed in Unreal 5, so uh, if you're on the latest version of Unreal 5 you may be able to, to do that. But, um, but yeah, this is where we ended up with uh, last time, these little red triangles. Um, we're going to be implementing the uh, avoidance for the uh, spotlight um, flashlight effect uh, and then a couple other bits as well so setting up the material and the mesh and passing those things along uh, so uh, let's get started so I'm just going to hide off the finished ones and I'm actually going to swap out this rock mesh here with this cube just to create a little bit sort of a little bit easier to see sort of the avoidance and things happening um, when the flashlight, when that happens. So, <clears throat> so what we're going to be doing is taking the flashlight information. So this is just a simple spotlight, um, and we're going to need that information inside of our Niagara system. So to do that, we're going to create a few more user exposed parameters. So we already have one here for box extents. That's sort of an input that we put in manually, uh, but we're also going to create a new set of data uh, based around that light. And we're going to use a blueprint to pass that data across. So, uh, so there's two vectors, light position and also light, uh, let's do direction. And then also three floats as well. So um, light radius, another float, light in a cone. And light, oops, another float, light, counter cone. So the position and the direction of the light, uh, we need those to work out how the spotlight's working. And then also the uh, inner, uh, inner outer cone, um, and also this light radius. Uh, so how big is the light? How much of it's affecting things? <coughs> now we don't want to plug those numbers in manually. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a blueprint. Uh, it's going to pass the data across from, from one to the other. Now, you could make one blueprint and contain everything inside it. That's how that was set up in the content examples. Um, nothing wrong with that, totally works, but you can also do it uh, this way. And so I'm going to create a blueprint. I'm just going to reference these two actors uh, and use that to pass the data across. So um, just gives you a little bit more flexibility. It means you can use your Niagara system without having to do the spotlight kind of pass through stuff. Um, but no real difference in, in sort of functionality. So let's do this new blueprint, actor blueprint, PP class light manager, and just drag a copy of this into the world. So there's nothing going to be inside the blueprint itself. Um, but what we are going to do is going to create two references. One is going to be the light reference, and that's going to be of type spotlight object reference. And I'm going to make this instance editable. Uh, and we'll see why in a second. And then the second one is going to be our uh, uh, Niagara reference. And that's going to be of type Niagara actor uh, object reference and also yeah, instance editable. If I just compile and save that, these two variables, if I select my blueprint, they can be set. They can be set here from our um, details panel. And we can just select which spotlight we're getting the data from uh, and which Niagara system we're going to pass it to. So in this case, it's the class one. Uh, and then inside of our blueprint, we're going to actually do that sort of passing of data. Now, I'm not going to do it as a uh, thing here in the construction script. I'm actually going to do it as its own function. Uh, so I create a function here, update light values, uh, and we'll see why in a second. So inside my update light values, I want to get the data from my light. So firstly, uh, the world uh, position. So get world, get actor, instances actor location. There we are. So that's where the light is. And then I can also get forward vector. That's which way it's facing. And then if I get the inner cone angle, um, if we just 
do create this node here, the set in a cone angle. Um, that's not what we want, but it's giving us this node here. So the reference is to the actor, uh, and the actor is the object that lives in the world that has position and, and forward vector, that's fine. But the data about the inner cone angle, that's to do with the actual spotlight itself. So we need to get the spotlight component um, so we can then access the data inside the light itself. So um, up to you how you do that. Um, but if we try and pull off here and do get in a cone angle, it won't let us do that because that doesn't exist on the actor reference. Uh, instead, we need to get the spotlight component reference and then we can get the inner cone angle and we can get that data. So uh, Blueprints are smart enough to work that step out if we talk about setting the inner cone angle. Um, and it'll sort of give you these brackets here to show you that it's jumping an extra component in there. Um, but it won't be smart enough to do it for getting. Um, so that's why there's no get in a cone angle there. Um, might work if you turn off context sensitive. Yeah, get in a cone angle. But then you need to still make this um, this jump yourself. So um, as I say, however you want to do that. Um, inner cone angle is one of the data. Uh, outer cone angle is another piece of data that we need. Oops. Get cone. In again, outer. What's going on here? Get outer. Get outer cone angle. There it is. Uh, and then the last thing is the radius. So get radius, and it's the attenuation radius we want. That's the size of the light, uh, and we'll use that in our calculations. So that's the data we need from the light. And what we're going to do is bring in our Niagara object, or our reference to our Niagara actor, uh, and we're going to do a set vector parameter value Niagara component. So same thing, um, we're going to create a reference to the actual component inside of the actor and then also um, the thing we're going to set about that is the vector parameter. Um, quick note about names, we need to call names here explicitly. If we go back to what we called this earlier, so let's do light position first. Um, it's got this user namespace, so although uh, the name here is light position because of that user namespace if we just copy the reference and then paste it here you can see the way that's named is it's user dot light position so this name here needs to be correct in order to refer to this and it's using this namespace as part of that uh, that string so that's our light position light direction well that's the same that's going to be a, another vector parameter uh, user dot light direction, whoops, oh, let's just type it, use a lot of light direction, and um, we're just going to plug these values in, so plugging those two vectors in, making sure that we're connecting the uh, the target each time as well, when you copy and paste it doesn't connect the target, um, so that's the first two, uh, these three are floats, so same principle, set float parameter, um, target is this effects system component, uh, inner cone angle, and this was user dot light inner cone. Uh, connect that one up. Just double check that is correct. Light inner cone. Yep. Um, obviously, it's maybe safer to copy and paste, um, but up to you. I find it a bit easier just to type it out and just double check. Light outer cone. It's this one. Last one, light radius. And that's that one. Okay. Oh, missed my target. There we go. So, uh, five bits of data, all being taken from the light, passed across to the system via uh, a quick blueprint. Now, this is a function, if you remember. Um, and what we're going to do is in our construction script, we're just going to call that function. Now, we could have put all of that into the construction script. Um, but the advantage of doing this this way, uh, we can also go to our event graph, um, and I'm just going to do it on tick as well. So every frame, we're going to pass that data across. So that's going to allow us to then move the light, and then while we're playing the game, the light's going to move, uh, and all that data is going to pass across uh, every frame. Um, cool. Let's just test that that has worked. Um, well, not the easiest thing to test, to be honest. Um, but if we connect that up move that across, it's reading the data from here uh, and passing it through into our 
into our system. Cool. So now that we have that information, uh, I'm just going to quickly edit this a little bit, um, make it a little bit easier to see. So uh, in my initialized particle, I'm just going to make them a little bit smaller. 0.25 and 0.35, maybe like that. Uh, and then also spawn a lot more of them. So say 500 rather than 50. Um, we're not getting a much bigger swarm of particles here. Um, cool. So the module we're going to be using to uh, get our particles to avoid our flashlight um, already exists in uh, in Niagara, in the engine, um, but it's not exposed to the library. So if I go to my update and I add a avoid cone, or if I type in avoid cone, it doesn't appear here. Uh, in the add new module um, because we've got the library only selected. Um, I'm not entirely sure why this hasn't been exposed to the library. It might be that it's still uh, experimental, not fully featured and, and realized, um, but it does come with the engine installation. So it is there um, that we can use. And if I turn off that library only, we get this one here, avoid cone. Um, little star shows that it's not exposed to the library. Don't know whether that's just a, an oversight um, I think it's probably just that it's still in the testing phase. Um, and so if you're on five, this might be uh, in the library or it might happen at some point in the future. Um, but this is already a module that exists. Yeah, avoid cone. Uh, you just need to turn off the library filtering um, to be able to view that. This is going to be up here um, somewhere. Let's do it before the curl noise. I think that's the right place. Um, yeah, uh, and what this does um, is it does what it says. It avoids a cone um, location. So we're going to pass in all the light, da light data um, that we got from our blueprint, and we're going to define basically the same light shaft cone that we've got here. And then any particles that are within that uh, are automatically going to push themselves outwards uh, and try and avoid um, avoid that surface or avoid that that lit area. Um, so. Let's do that. I'm just going to select the one over here. Make sure I'm doing the right thing. Um, OK. So once to be active, the um, strength that we're going to use to do this, uh, well, we'll cover that later. Let's do apply cone. So we're going to apply constraints to it. Uh, and that's going to um, find the nearest surface. So that's going to keep the particles on the on the GPU, um, and the thing we need down here is to update our cone data. So the apex of the cone, well, that's the the cone position or the light position. Uh, user dot light position, cone axis, well, that's the user light direction. Uh, it's in world space, and then here we have our inner angle, outer angle, and radius. So we're just going to plug that in from the data that we've got. Inner, outer, and radius. Give that a sec to compile. And what that should do is just take our particles, anything that's inside that cone that we've defined, uh, and push it outwards. And so we're getting a little bit of bouncing off. Uh, our strength value is currently set very high. Um, we can lower that down. Very low strength is not doing a huge amount. Let's just fiddle the values until we get something that's um, that's working. Um, it's worth saying or trying uh, when you're dealing with things like this, just to see that they're working. Just try plugging in very high values. It's obviously giving some really crazy results, but you can see it's doing what we want here. So it's avoiding that um, that light shaft or that light cone, that illuminated face uh, where the uh, the particles are, are, are impacting that. So. Um, if we move our light, because of our setup, um, we haven't updated our data. So if I wanted to see that sort of new location reflected in my particles, I'd have to come here and then um, move my, my blueprint. Uh, that's going to rerun the construction script. That's going to then update the data in our, uh, our system and we get our, our, new, our new light.
If that were all one blueprint, that might be a bit easier to do, but you'd have to be moving the light in the blueprint itself. So um, there's pros and cons to that sort of workflow. But um, but that's it. To get the particles to avoid the, uh, the cone, um, we just need to pass the data from the light into the system, uh, and then we can um, use that to avoid uh, our locations. Um, now that would be fine, that works very well uh, for what we're doing here, but there is an issue depending on what you're trying to do with this. Well, what's happening here? Well, if I go to this light shaft, or this light spotlight cone, we can see we've got our particles avoiding the light impact at the top here. That's great. Uh, but they're also avoiding this area here. Uh, this part of our system, these particles should be in shadow. They should be not avoiding that part because they're only avoiding the light. Um, so we've got an issue. Maybe for your system, it's not actually worth worrying about. Um, depending on if you've just got like a player based flash light, you can't see the other side of, of the shadowed areas anyway, because you're kind of controlling that flashlight. Um, but for full fidelity, uh, we can add another step into this. Um, and what we want to do is also check is is our particle uh, in the lit area uh, or not in the lit area. Um, and so we're going to use a different module to do that. And then we're going to combine the two. And basically, we're only going to use the avoid uh, box module uh, where the particles are in the light. Uh, and so these ones will avoid. These ones down here won't avoid. And we'll get sort of particles filling up this sort of light shaft cone in the shadows. So next step. How do we add that? Well, um, we might draw this out first. Uh, if I just create a new module or a new image. Um, what we're going to do, right, let's draw a quick diagram. So we have our surface as defined by our, um, by our, our GPU what's it called, um, by our distance field. So this is the, the surface as the engine understands it, uh, kind of like in cross section. And then we have our light position. And this is drawing a cone of light. Uh, and that's what we're currently doing our avoidance for. Um, and then each of our particles, if I just start with the usual color maybe. Um, if our particles here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a line trace um, through our particle. Uh, and the light, um, and we're going to trace to the GPU, uh, to the, the the depth buffer, the depth, what's it called, uh, distance field. That's the one. We're going to trace to the distance field, um, and so basically we're going to say, if I draw a straight line from my light source to my particle, do I intersect with the distance field? And this side of my um, of my obstacle, I don't. Uh, if I just by redrawing that line so it only goes from here to here. If I draw a line from here to here, I'm not passed through my distance field at any point. So I know that this particle on this side is in direct illumination. If I create another one, another color over here, let's do another layer. If I've got a particle here and I draw a direct line from there to my point, my light source, if I trace through my, um, my distance field there, I'm gonna intersect, aren't I? I'm gonna hit my, uh, my distance field. So I know that if my trace fails, I'm in shadow. And that's gonna be the sort of approach that we're gonna do here. And so we're gonna use a line trace through distance field using the particle position and the part, uh, the light position. Uh, and that will let us know whether the particle is in direct illumination or not. So uh, let's do this. The module for it is ray trace distance field GPU. Again, not exposed to the library. Uh, I think a lot of these modules were created for this example for the Unreal 5 tech demo and they just haven't been sort of pushed through into the sort of overall library yet but um, but they do exist in the engine we're not making custom scratch modules here uh, and it's ray trace distance field GPU I'm going to put that just after the um, just in front of the avoid cone actually and we'll see why uh, in a second so um, just to bring across the example that we're working from. Again, this is from the content examples in um, the Epic content. Uh, they've used custom input scripts. Um, so you can write your own custom input scripts 
which are named scripts here. But actually all it's doing, at least this one here, the direction to cone, it's just subtracting one minus the other. And so we could go in and recreate this script, custom input strip, script. Um, but I'm just going to do it in sort of in line, as it were, um, and just make sure that we're copying exactly what's what's been put here. Um, the other one here, find end position. Well, it's just some math. Uh, if I open this up, there we go. Uh, subtracting the sort of particle position from the light apex, uh, and then we're doing a little bit of math to just sort of fudge that a little bit. And we'll talk about why why we're doing that. So I'm just going to copy this. Um, these sort of inputs across. So the ray origin, and we're going to be doing this from, let's have a look at the other one. Excuse me one second. Just make sure I'm copying this across correctly. So here we are. So taking the um, Content examples as reference, I've just broken it down into an inline thing. And what we're going to be doing here is taking the particle position here, uh, the point light there, and actually we're taking that direction and we're just going to offset it along that direction a little bit, um, a sort of value, just so that we're a little bit off the surface. If you're too close to the surface here and you start line tracing, you'll get kind of like fake hits, uh, or at least you're getting kind of like false positives. Um, so by just moving it off from the surface um, along that axis, um, you're giving it a little bit more more room to breathe. So that's what we're doing here. So the rate origin, uh, it's going to be a add vector. And the two things we're adding together um, in A is going to be a multiply vector, which is going to be a normalized vector. The vector we're normalizing is a subtract vector. And the two things we're subtracting are the light position. And we're taking away the particle position. And then in B, get this right. Normalized vector B is, in this case, 10. Well, Let's do this as a different float. Value of 10, and then the thing we're is position. And I'll explain all of this in a second. Um, okay. So, as I said, just said, um, we are taking the light position, subtracting the particle position. So the light position here. Let's use another, let's just get rid of these actually. Um, so it's a new layer, here we are. Let's do it in red. So our particle position is here. We are taking away our one position from another. So we're getting the vector along that direction. Uh, we are normalizing it. So what that will do will give us just the direction component and not the length. So it doesn't matter how far away our light is. All we want to know is what direction is that. Um, and so we'll draw that like this, that will give us that direction. We are multiplying that by, in this case, um, a value here of 10. So that's going to give us our sort of offset off the surface. So this is our, our position that we're calculating from. Uh, and we are doing then a multiply um, by the position uh, and adding that particle position back in again. So this is giving us a um, slightly offset position from the surface. Uh, to then start <coughs> start our ray trace from. Um, okay, the direction, the ray vector, uh, is again just going to be a quick subtract, and we're subtracting the light position and the particle position, and so we are doing um, a ray trace from a slightly offset position to the thing, to, to the direction of the light. Um, and then we also need to do a maximum trace length. So this um, this direction vector is also going to be our, uh, our kind of like how far we're going to trace as well. So that's also going to be a subtract. And we're doing particle position. Particle position. 
position. It's not coming up as an automatic thing. Article position. That's because I've got subtract float in there, and that should be a uh, vector length mister step. So it's the length of the direction vector. Um, so we're doing a subtract vector. There we go. And then it's particle position minus the light position. And then the other settings should be OK. Um, just check what this is writing. Oops. Right, uh, and we're writing out some data there. So again, what we're doing, taking that position, offsetting it along this direction a little bit, and then we're tracing from this position back to the light, um, and then we're only tracing a maximum distance of that. Um, and so this one will succeed, this one from this side will fail, because it's going to hit this instead, uh, or the other way around. This trace is going to result in a hit, as it hits there, and this trace isn't going to result in a hit because it doesn't have anything uh, in between. So if we can just preview this, uh, we have a result here, distance field, DPU, that's the name of the module here, um, intersects, and that's an output Boolean. Um, we should be able to do it, see that in our things here. So it's output, ray trace, distance field, GPU, don't find some more space intersects yeah and we can see this is a boolean result so <clears throat> whether that intersection uh, is true or not uh, and the way i'm just going to preview that is quickly with a color module so here at the end i'm going to do a linear color from ball and then the boolean we're going to use is the intersects and it's going to write either a black or white um, and just check I've got my material set up to use particle color. Uh, I believe I do. Red, use particle color. Yes. Here we go. Um, and so what should happen is where I particles are inside of the light, we're getting uh, a value of black. And where they're not, we're getting a value of white. Um, So you can see here, these particles down here, which are white, <coughs> we can exclude from the avoid cone, and that will fill in these values down here. So a uh, little bit tricky. I definitely struggled to get that module uh, working a little bit. Um, just, let's say, going through line by line, copying across the, the information from the example. Um, but hopefully, at least the principle uh, of what it's trying to do here uh, makes sense of uh, tracing to the um, sort of the surface uh, and checking whether you're seeing the light or not. And if you are, great, we can carry on doing an avoidance. If we're not, well, we don't want to do that. So how do we connect those two things up? Well, if we go to back to our avoid cone module, here in the strength, uh, we're going to do a float from ball. And the boolean we're going to use is that intersect. So because that distance field, ray trace distance field module is above. <clears throat> we now have that intersection value. Uh, if it does intersect, then we want our strength to be zero. And if, we, if our, it doesn't intersect, we can have our, our strength still be 50. And what that should do, if I've done this correctly, is up here, these black particles are being illuminated. That's kind of the wrong way around. Let's just swap that around to make it a bit more um, logical, I guess. So now our white particles are being illuminated, our black ones are in shadow, um, and the shadowed particles aren't having the avoid particle, uh, avoid cone um, thing being applied. So two steps, one, the avoid cone for where the light is, and then another one for like, are you in light, are you in shadow? Um, obviously there's limitations to this. Uh, it's only gonna affect stuff that has the distance field to it. Uh, if we had a dynamic character who walked in front of this light, that wouldn't necessarily affect this because we'd have to pass that information through and everything. That wouldn't exist in the um, in the distance field representation of the scene. So, so some limitations, but for what we're doing here, pretty nice result. Um, 
to stop these particles avoiding the cone. Cool. Just make these red. They're a bit easier to see. So the next thing um, that I tried to replicate from the example um, was this idea of using custom data. Uh, and unfortunately, this is where I hit a couple of crashes. So I'll show you how they've set things up and what, what we're trying to do here. Um, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do this exactly. But we can we can kind of work with that. So um, in effects, oh, sorry, in blueprints, um, we have these two things here, numerations and structures. And so uh, we'll just create a custom enumeration. Uh, I'm going to call this class enum. That'll do. And what an enum is, is just a, uh, a series of um, named things in a list. Uh, and so what the idea behind this was in the, in the example is that we would have two sets of data. Um, so we have, what was it called, wonder or, I don't know, active insect and then passive insects. insects. Uh, the idea being that we can just select um, from a drop-down either active or passive uh, and that will allow us to then load in a load of data to do with how fast they're moving, how fast they're animating, all of that. Uh, and it's just a way of sort of controlling controlling things. Um, a while back I did a series or uh, a video on blueprints and using custom structs and enums there. Same kind of principles apply. So um, if you are wanting to know a bit more about uh, enums and structs, um, you can go and check that video out and it will work and not crash um, like it currently does in Niagara. Um, but that's our enum. We can have as many of these as we want. Uh, and maybe flying. Sometimes we might have flying insects. I don't know how we'd cope with those. That's beyond the scope of this, uh, this video for sure. Um, I don't know, maybe dead. Maybe they can get killed somehow and then they stop moving entirely. Um, but you can go in and you can create as many states as you want here um, as kind of named states. And then what we would do is create a custom struct blueprint struct so then class struct uh, and we can go in here and this is just a kind of container for lots of types of data um, classic example I always use is a transform so a transform is a type of struct it has within it location rotation and scale values uh, they're all vectors each vector is a com combination of three floats and that kind of buildup of data it's just much easier when you're dealing with actors to talk about moving transform data around uh, and then breaking that when you need it well we can do the same thing here if we have a an active state we might want to have a velocity scale and that would be a float oops and then we can create as many new variables as we want so we might have a um, let's do mesh scale and that would be probably a vector and if they've been killed they could be squashed we could squash them flat and just scale them down uh, and we could control that there um, and we could go through again and again um, I'm trying to think what they had in their example uh, if we just have a look and open this up um, this is the oh, that's not the right one this is the one this is the example from the content browser um, and they've done it here uh, Default chill is the module they've called it here, uh, and they've set this to wonder, and this is using that custom enum. So you can set this to either wonder or scared. That's just a thing that they've called it. They've just named it wonder, named it scared. Um, and then here in the swarm force coordinator, they've actually plugged in a whole load of data. So this is the wonder state, uh, and you can see here affecting the curl noise forces, um, the, the state machine to how often it swaps between being active and passive. Um, during the wonder state, it's quite slow. During the scared state, it's much faster. And so it's just kind of um, creating two different sort of sets of data. And then rather than sort of handling them one by one by one everywhere, it's much easier to just set them uh, as this one big switch um, and do it that way. Unfortunately, this is where um, I found a bug. Um, the node here, break, swars, break swarm force struct um, created a um, yeah an unfixable crash for me in my version of 4.27 so um, unfortunately that's 
where this sort of part of this example um, is going to have to end. Um, but one last thing, so I should maybe have said this earlier, once you've created your custom struct and your custom enum, you need to tell Niagara where they live uh, and to be able to use them. So in project settings, uh, all settings down here in plugins Niagara, um, you need to set these as additional enums and structs that Niagara can understand. So there's some already in the in the engine. Um, uh, yeah, so I created a couple. Uh, I had a, an enum for swarm state, active and passive. Uh, I had a struct just doing velocity multiplier, curl force, noise multiplier, and debug color. Uh, and unfortunately, even though they were added in the Niagara project properties, um, they yeah were causing a, a crash with this. So unfortunately, this isn't going to be something we can do. But um, at some point, Unreal 5, uh, these should be a usable, useful thing to be able to do. Uh, and so it's nice to know a little bit about them, um, even if we can't actually follow that sort of pipeline through exactly. Um, so how might we want to use this? Well, we have our flashlight. Uh, and so if our flashlight activates or intersects with our particles, um, our, our insects, they're going to get scared. They're going to get illuminated. They're going to get scared. We want them to run away. So we want to sort of multiply the velocity for the particles up here that are being affected by our flashlight. Um, and I'm just going to preview that briefly as well. So currently our preview coloring here is done on are you illuminated by the light? Um, but there's a, an output value here from our avoid cone um, called normalized mask. And that's just going to tell me, um, are you illuminated? If so, by how much? Uh, and that's using these kind of in and out angle um, light angles. So this is a float. So if I go back to my color, rather than doing a, a ball, uh, I'm just going to do this as a lerp between linear colors. And the let factor is going to be that normalized mask. So this is our avoid cone normalized mask. And again, I'm just going to do this as red to make it a bit clearer to see. So in the example, uh, this would be affecting the everything about it, the speed, velocity, everything. Uh, we're just going to affect color for now. Um, let's do this the other way around. So this is black. And then these ones are red. And you can see any particles that get a little bit close to the light go sort of flat red, and then they just avoid the cone. Um, and so we can use this as a sort of velocity multiplier. Uh, but actually, we can go one step further. Um, just plugging this directly into our, into our particle velocity would work, would definitely help. Um, but we kind of want this sort of lag factor. So once a particle uh, has been illuminated, the mask is going to value is going to come up, uh, and then they're going to be um, sort of scared and have this velocity. Uh, but as soon as they're outside of that light, they get they get sort of kill again. They get kind of uh, no longer being kind of overly activated. Um, so we kind of want to have a bit of a delay built into this, uh, and that's where we're going to use another module. Um, again, not exposed to the library, but is in built into this, uh, and it's called fade value over time. Uh, Oh, no, this isn't the library. So this is one of the inbuilt modules. Uh, fade over time. And what we're going to do is just after that avoid cone, we're going to take the um, that value, that normalized mask, and we're just going to sort of scale it down um, so that we're not kind of taking off the, uh, the effect of that being lit um, completely all in one frame. Um, so it's not like a live update of are you lit? It's more of a kind of fading over time update or have you been lit recently, uh, if that makes sense. So let's copy my values across. So this is going to be percentage based um, and we're going to fade by a random amount, um, somewhere between, let's say one and two, um, minimum step 0.01 and the target value. So what are we going to try and fade towards? Well. This is a multiply of two values. One is the normalized mask. So the avoid cone normalized mask. And the thing we're multiplying it by is going to be a 
float from ball and the boolean we're using is the intersect and it's the other way around 0 and 1 I'm just going to set a little minimum value in there as well so what's this doing well uh, when our particle is in the light the normalized mask is going to be set to 1 I'm saying we are illuminated we are within the flashlight cone and that's coming from the avoid cone module um, but then we also need to do that check of are you on the shadow side or are you on the not shadowed side and that's what this custom float from ball is doing so if you are shadowed well just it doesn't matter you're multiplying by zero all the time you don't need to get that extra uh, velocity kick um, but if you're not shadowed well that means you're illuminated well if you're illuminated if you're on the illuminated side and you're also within the illuminated cone then we have a value uh, and then what that's going to do is it's going to write to this value here fade over time current value and it's going to slowly kind of scale down over time so if we go back to our example let's have a look here so here our particles are just flashing red as they hit the the cone um, and then they're being pushed out by the avoid force but what i want to do is now use that faded value so my lerp factor in my color preview is going to be my fade over time and then when that compiles what should happen is as a particle hits the light cone it becomes red and activates and then a few seconds later it's going to move away and then it's still going to be red for a little bit of time and then slowly over time they're going to fade back down to uh, back to black and you can see that happening here so um, fade over time here just giving us a little bit of memory effectively a little bit of um, yeah data uh, over time so that the particles get lit up, get scared, get active, run around, uh, and then slowly um, sort of fade back down to, um, to nothing. As I said, the way they did this in the example was to use two, test, two different states and then pick the data between them. Um, we can't do that, but we can just come in and, and use this. So this fade over time value, if I go back to my um, particle velocity here, if you remember from the last video, this is currently connected to the time-based state machine. So this is um, time-based state machine is kind of lerping from positive to negative, and that's creating that random uh, kind of movement, random changing from, from moving or not moving. Uh, but we want to also now combine it with this fade over time as well. So if I go in here, uh, let's do it as a curve. So my particle velocity is going to be rather than just the velocity itself, I'm going to do velocity multiplied by a curve. And this is going to be the other way around. So effectively what I'm doing here is I'm remapping my, uh, my velocity, um, not based on the particle's age, but using that on-off value, on-off percentage. So before I was just multiplying the two together, this gives me a little bit extra control um, I can go in and I can add another key, key in here and I can kind of scale let's do this uh, can I put it on the curves why can I not okay baby there we go um, this will just give me a little bit more control than just multiplying the two together so now as the on off percentage starts to fade they start to speed up and then slow down but I don't just want to use the on-off percentage on its own. I want to combine that with that fade, fade over time value because then that will kind of help to overwrite it because uh, a particle that's in the illumination always wants to be moving fast. So what I'll do is in this looking up the index, not just going to use the percentage, I'm going to do a clamp of two floats added together. And I'm going to add the on-off percentage time based on off percentage and I'm going to add the fade over time current value so if our fade over time current value is high that means it's recently been illuminated I want you to be active so a value of one over there will give me a value of one here so we're multiplying by one on the velocity so I'll keep them velocity high uh, a value of uh, a low value um, and we'll kind of combine those two together. So as long as there's something telling it to move, it will move. And that can either just be the random up and down over time from the on-off percentage, or it can be the um, 
the, the flashlight driven uh, fade value here and we're just clamping by one uh, obviously we don't want to ever go over one if we just turn that up to two for a second what we'll find um, is the particles will occasionally get very very active because this is happening every frame so anytime you're multiplying by a value over one especially if I just bring this value up here um, they'll zoom and just ex explode here so um, just make sure that you're clamping by one um, there we go oops let's scale this value down to one as well yeah and now what we should find is as the particles get illuminated by the light they get really active and then that takes a little bit of time to fade away um, and then the ones that are not lit up are quite kind of passive over here cool quick little test for this uh, I've set my spotlight to movable um, and remember we've got our blueprint updating every frame so if I just go in here and simulate I should be able to take hold of my spotlight uh, and I'm just going to move this in the world and as I move this across you can see it's taking those particles and they're being um, kind of scaled up so their velocity is being scaled up which is helping to push them out of the way and then also they're using the avoid cone module so they're not kind of filling in that space um, over time so quite a nice um, result for that you, know, so you can see the little insects here as well as the little red triangles but, um, but they're both working now both have the same results Awesome, so one last little uh, step. Um, I have imported the insects from the content examples um, and we're just gonna have a quick look at how those are working. So the mesh itself uh, is here. Now this has been animated through the material. Um, if I just go to wireframe. Uh, the it's not a skeletal mesh it's not a rigged object uh, or whether it's not using the skeletal mesh system to do its animation in fact it's animated through uh, vertex animation textures uh, I believe I've mentioned them before on the channel but um, not going to go too deep into them here they're probably a whole video tutorial series on their own now what we're going to do is we're just going to open up the um, the material and have a look at what's going on in here so um, lots of things happening for the color and the appearance of things and then down here we've got this thing animation so what we've got is these textures um, if I just open up this one here walk position texture it's very small and if I zoom right in it's got an alpha channel which I'm gonna have to turn off to be able to see anything um, but this is our texture and what this actually is is a a record of every position um, and every vertex over the course of an animation uh, and so this is only 15 pixels wide and 27 pixels down uh, what that means is it's 15 vertices being animated by 27 frames so it's a 27 frame loop with 15 vertices being accessed uh, and so the first frame here um, is this first line across the top and so we can use this data that we've saved down to a texture um, to then drive the animation and then just frame by frame we'll just come down um, and read different values now as I say this is uh, creating these um, can be done in Maya or 3ds Max or Houdini um, but it's all done outside of the engine and you're baking that animation down into these um, these vertex animation textures not going to be a big topic for today we've already done a lot and there's all this little bit left to do um, but this is the principle of what's happening here um, same here so rotation data again very small texture not many things not many verts being animated here um, but we get different animation data uh, and the engine comes with these modules so this one here uh, static mesh skeletal animation static mesh skeletal animation this is just a default um, engine um, module and say so here uh, it's really used with this 3ds max script uh, which you can go and you can get but again not for today but what it's actually doing is is doing this animation uh, and there's a sort of ambient flickering for the wings that occasionally kind of flicker up 
Uh, you can kind of see it in this sphere rotation. This doesn't make any sense. Um, it needs to apply to the rig beetle model. Okay. Um, so we've got the occasional ambient wing flap, um, and then also the leg movement. But the leg movement only wants to happen when our particles are moving. Uh, and so we need to connect those two things together. And the way we use do that uh, is with this thing, a dynamic parameter module. Uh, so this is a material parameter or material node set up that then also speaks to Niagara uh, and we can just pass this data through and then the material will calculate how far the particles moved and therefore how far um, the animation should have played and we can get them to kind of move and look like they're scuttling while they're moving uh, and not when they're standing still. Uh, at least that's the idea. Uh, again, not going to have time to go through all of this material uh, now. Um, hopefully that explains what's happening. Um, there's quite a lot of extra bits in here, but, but basically we've baked the animation down to texture and we're using a value driven by Niagara to kind of update that animation. And it's just a little looping walk cycle. Let's not save. Okay. Uh, this is the wrong one. So our little red triangles. Well, the um, the distance travelled, or how far our particles uh, moved, is actually again another module. Uh, track distance travelled. We put it here right at the end. Um, that will just automatically take the information of our particle where it's moved uh, and add it every frame to this thing called a distance travelled accumulator. And so over the course of a few seconds, our particles move around uh, and this will track how far they have moved. And then all we need to do is take a dynamic material parameters module um, and then by swap out our mesh to be our rigged beetle. That should pick up the right names uh, and we can plug in these values. So bug radius is particle radius. Uh, I could spell radius. Not calculate particle radius. Oh, is that probably something we need to do? Maybe I missed a step. Uh, yes, so we need to calculate our, or we need to create a parameter for our particle radius. Um, well, fine, we'll just plug a value in for that for now. Um, the important thing is, is these two here, the current distance traveled uh, and the previous distance traveled. So the current distance traveled is our track distance traveled distance travel accumulator. Um, but there isn't a previous distance traveled. Um, track distance travel, that's the only output we've got here. So what we need to do is we need to store the distance we've traveled earlier in the frame, uh, earlier in the update. Then we do our calculations and move the particle, and then we calculate the distance traveled again. So uh, here, this track distance traveled is writing to a value here. Well, if we go to the start of our, our module stack, um, set new or existing parameter value directly, right at the top, I'm going to create a new particle parameter, which is going to be a float, and it's going to be previous frame distance traveled. And we're going to set the value for that to be our output of our track distance traveled. Um, and let's just find this particles distance traveled accumulator. This one. Previous frame track distance traveled. Now this should give us an error and it does. Um, what's happening here is the first frame that we're trying to do this calculation. Uh, we're trying to calculate how far the particle has moved but we haven't actually called this value yet, this distance traveled accumulator, so here, was read before being set. So we're trying to read it up here, but we're trying to set it there. Well, that's actually what we want, because we want in future frames to be able to read the value, store it, and then recalculate it, and then use them both at the same time. Um, but we can't do it on the first frame because it doesn't exist. Well, that's easy enough. If we go here, set new or existing parameters directly, just in our particle spawn, we just make sure to set that track previous distance train track track previous distance frame traveled this one we just make sure to set that to be zero that should if I compile 
No, which one's not being used? Particles track distance travelled. Well, let's just set them both to zero. So this and this. No. Right, there we go. So we need to basically just initialize those values. So when the particle is spawned, obviously it hasn't traveled very far, hasn't traveled anywhere at all. That's going to be set to zero for both of those. And then when we get to the update, we can actually do our calculations without having to rely on a value that hasn't been spawned yet. Um, now that we have that data, we can pass it through to our material, previous frame distance traveled. Uh, and so we're doing, particles previous frame distance travels there we go um, so now we have how far you've traveled this frame how far you had traveled last frame and the material will cope with that um, and to do that calculation it's not perfect uh, you could go in and tweak these values a little bit but hopefully you can see as the particles moving um, the speed at which their kind of legs are going it's a bit high uh, I think our particle radius just isn't correct. So if we just change our radius down a little bit, there we go. Um, so we're just kind of dialing in the speed. Um, and you could maybe put a clamp on that so that when it's not moving very far at all, so the legs aren't moving at all. But um, as a result, that's not too bad. So fast moving particles have a lot of distance traveled, a lot of the animation update. Um, low, slow moving particles uh, will get um, very slow leg movements. Um, and that kind of combines together. So, yeah. Okay, another long video. Um, it is a complicated effect. There is a lot going on, but hopefully each of those steps kind of breaks down into something that kind of makes sense. Um, as I say, if you are gonna try and recreate this, please do open up the content examples and, and look through. I've not done exactly one-to-one -one in every case, um, but hopefully each step kind of breaks down what we're trying to do and, and how we've kind of accomplished it. So um, as a quick revision for what we did this class uh, in this video, um, we used firstly a blueprint. Um, if I find my blueprint, there it is. Uh, we used a blueprint to pass information from the world to our, our particle system. Really, really powerful. Do this all the time. Anytime you need to refer back to actors in the world or have some information from the world around passed to your system, this works really, really well. Uh, it's very cheap, we're just taking data and moving it, um, and we're just doing it every frame so that it responds to the animation. Um, get the data here, just pass it through there. Uh, very powerful, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, then using that data, we've done an avoid cone module to avoid the light. Um, that works really well for surfaces that are kind of directly in the light. Didn't work for surfaces that were shadowed by an object. So then we needed to have a ray trace distance field GPU module. Uh, just basically checking, are you in indirect illumination? Uh, this one did take a little while, as I say, to kind of um, get the, the idea behind what was happening correct. Um, but, but this is basically it. We're taking our particle position, we're offsetting a little bit towards the light, and we're checking that against this ray. Uh, does it hit anything if it does that well here? If we did the same thing and then took a ray there, yes, we are. We're hitting the, um, the mesh distance field. Uh, now we have those two. We can work out which particles are actually directly being lit by the light. Uh, and then we're just going to take that information uh, and store it over a few frames or over a few seconds. Um, you have been lit. You're scared. You're fast. You're multiplying your velocity um, or adding to your velocity multiplier. Um, and then the last thing, just tracking the distance traveled. Uh, so the material using a vertex animation, um, seeing how far the particle's moving, and as it moves, it will um, update the, the, the walking animation. And, um, hopefully in a future video, I'll have a look at how we can make our own vertex animation textures uh, and set those up, but a little beyond the scope of this one. Um, so we've already got basically to another hour. So. Um, Hopefully you've enjoyed that journey. There's been a lot of information. Um, as always, any questions, please do let me know either in the comments below or by sending me an email. Uh, or if you have anything else you'd like to see, any other topics um, you'd like covered about Niagara, materials, tech art, blueprints, anything like that, please do let me know. Uh, and then finally, a uh, big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. Um, yeah, and I will see you all next time.